So the reason why we're having this call today is just because it is, um, well, seniors are choosing the colleges that they've gotten into. And um, from there, that means weighing financial aid offers. And that's really important because obviously you don't want to go to school that's substantially more expensive than it needs to be or anything like that. Um, so yeah. Um, so I'm just going to introduce yourselves really quickly. My name is Michael Sanchez and I'm the executive director of TCAT and I'm a sophomore at Yale studying English and education studies. My name is Elizabeth. I'm the assistant director at TCAT. Uh, I graduated Memorial 2018 and I study computer engineering at Johns Hopkins. All right, so unfortunately Max isn't here right now, but that's Max. He's wonderful. He went to UVA in 2016. He's actually the person who got in contact with um, Chris Doran originally and he went to Memorial for two years. And then we also have some new faces here, which is really exciting. So I think Eric Marquin isn't here either right now, but he is a soft, uh, first year at Yale studying, I think, chemical engineering, and he was in our first TCAT class. Hello, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Zapata. I'm a first year here at UVA. I'm studying biochemistry on a pre-med track, and uh, I'm the first year and second year advisor here in the TCAT program. Great. Okay. So that's everyone. And then, so just so you guys know, if you don't know what TCAT is already, um, essentially it's meant to help students who are attending under, um, attending college or high schools where students aren't um, usually going to colleges or aren't necessarily going to top tier schools, which generally means they're underfunded schools, and under-resourced schools as a whole. And then, and it's then helping them go to the best colleges that they can go to at no cost. And again, we know how intimidating applying to a college can be, and we're here to make that as accessible as possible. And so TCAT was formed in that mission about almost more than, yeah, definitely more than two years ago, and we're still going. So yeah. And so lastly, here is Chris Doran, who will be speaking and leading this call today. So Chris Doran is, well, Chris, you could introduce yourself, or I, I can start. Um, he works at the UVA. and. Um, He's been there since 2007, and he specifically is a, um, he's, I think, the director of financial, not financial services, but kind of financial education, and he's a really nice guy, and he um, really cares about TCAT, and yeah, I think that's a fairly good synopsis. Yeah, I think that's great. Do you want me to take it away? Go for it, yes. Okay, well, great, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me back. Um, we had a lot of fun last July um, that night, and uh, I got to meet Emmanuel, and and you go by Liz, right? Not Elizabeth, but mostly Liz. Yeah, and, yeah. And Michael, yeah, I've, I was looking actually at the, I got a new phone. I finally made the switch from Android to iPhone, and I was looking through photos, and I had the one where I was like, can I take a picture of everybody on the screen here after we were doing the debrief afterwards, and that was really nice, so it was a good reminder of, of that last year, and so um, some of the information that I'm going to talk about tonight that I'm going to show is, is sort of a quick recap of, uh, of what we talked about in July, and that's largely to set up the conversation about the meat and potatoes of this, which is taking a look at different, um, different offer letters, actual offer letters that I've culled from students, um, and uh, we'll have a chance to review them, and I'll talk about certain features of them, and I think what you'll immediately see is that they all look super different. And that, that alone, just that format, because you know you get the first one, you're like, okay, this is what a college offer or financial aid offer looks like. And then you get the next one, and it looks totally different. And sometimes it's a quick link from your admission letter, and it's super easy to find. And other times you're like, how do I even find my financial aid? Um, sometimes the school will release their admission decision, and then they'll say, hey, your financial aid might be ready in a couple of weeks. Um, and so that's kind of off-putting and a little bit, anxiety inducing too because you're like gosh I just got this notice end of March and if you're saying two weeks that only really only gives me a couple more weeks to to weigh the decisions and and um, my experience though with families and students in the past is that, that that time kind of compresses during the latter part of April when it comes to this process and um, you know you, you're going to find yourself thinking about it um, in all kinds of ways and odd times of the day probably sometimes when you really don't want to be thinking about it, but it just kind of intrudes into your consciousness. Um, I should say for disclosure purposes, I have a, a high school senior of my own this year, um, and it's my only child, and she is uh, making the decision herself. Um, she, so I have seen her go through the excitement and the disappointments 
Um, she applied to way too many schools. <laughs> That's not a criticism so much as I think that she just kind of set herself up for sort of this continuous drip of anxiety through um, February and March as, uh, as decisions came out. Um, you probably, many of you that might sound familiar to you as well, schools that didn't require supplemental essays, schools that uh, waived the application fees, schools that were test optional. Um, and I think it made it really hard on many schools. Um, and so there, I think that there, um, I, like I said, I just think it made it really hard on many schools to figure out exactly how to um, construct their class. And her experience with friends has been that, um, you know, really weird situations where um, friends of hers have been denied admission at some schools that are, um, are, are arguably sort of ostensibly less selective um, and then admitted and is going to a school that had like a 13% acceptance rate. So sort of denied by a school that has an 80% acceptance rate and admitted by what, so it's just weird, right? And it's not personal. Um, so that's my, kind of my pep talk if you're sort of still smarting a little bit from maybe some disappointments. Um, maybe though you all got into your first choice and, um, and you're stoked about that. So yeah. So congratulations to you all for, for, you know, the, for the, the successes you've had and, and, you know, showing admissions departments, admissions officers, you know, why that you'd, you'd be a, a great addition to their school. Um, the money part is, is, is really big. Uh, it's big for me. You know, I work at a school. I work at a university. We don't make a lot of money <laughs> working at a university. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, we're relying on financial aid and there are certain things that we, you know, we've saved some money. Um, and, but we're definitely looking really hard at the financial aid. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully I'm going to share my screen and, um, and then I will walk you through a couple of slides, try to be pretty brief about it. Cause again, as, as Michael said, this, this uh, deck is going to be shared, um, later on, Max has access to it and he'll figure out a way to share it. But, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that. And then I'm going to spend the most of the time um, looking through a couple of, uh, I've got like five examples that are offers. We're not going to necessarily look at all of them, but um, we'll take a look at the most as much as we can. And it'll help to illustrate, I hope, uh, some of the, uh, the points that, um, all right, can you all see my screen? Emmanuel, can you see that screen? Okay, great. Um, so we're going to bypass this introduction. Um, I, I am a communications manager and financial wellness uh, director in student financial services at the University of Virginia. So I talk to students every day, uh, pretty much, about things related to financial aid and making good financial decisions. Um, most important thing, if you remember nothing else about this, and this is a lesson you probably already know, but hopefully that this will just be confirmation of what you, you already believed. It's that it really is going to be up to you and your family to follow through and to be your own advocates when it comes to uh, the financial aid. Make sure that all your questions get asked and answered. And I'm going to help you with some of those questions tonight that you may have already thought of, you may have already asked, um, or ones that you haven't necessarily asked. Um, and uh, hopefully that will give you a little more confidence uh, as you, you know, work through the financial aid um, decision uh, and understanding exactly what it means at the end of the day in terms of how much your family might be, might be having to pay um, and uh, what the school's going to cover. So... Um, but I do emphasize financial aid officers are in the business of helping students. Um, some of them are going to be sort of more overtly friendly, like people like me and um, people at UVA um, tend to be in our office. And some of them may feel, feel more businesslike, but it, it's not personal. Um, they, they, their job is to help you understand and make an informed decision. And they want you to come to their school. Um, Okay, how to pay for college. Um, there's three main ways, which is free money, like grants and scholarships. There's borrowed money, if you're taking out loans, either for you or if your family is taking out loans on your behalf. And then there's your money, any savings or money that comes from earnings that your, your parents have, a uh, summer job that you have, or maybe even if you were offered federal work study as part of your financial aid package. And we'll talk a little bit more about, funny, about work study if you have questions about that. So those are the three main ways, and we're gonna talk about all of those tonight in the context of the examples that I've got going on. Okay, how to apply, of course, the FAFSA has to be done every year that you want financial aid. Um, most of the schools that I heard shared uh, where people are going are also schools that probably require the CSS profile, which is a separate application done through the College Board. Again, has to be done every year. 
Uh, and also, if your um, your parents are divorced or were never married, um, as is the case with me and, and my daughter's mom, uh, I had to complete what's called the non-custodial parent profile. And uh, most schools require that if they require the profile. So make sure that your non-custodial parent is doing their part to make sure that you uh, get considered on time for all of the financial aid that uh, you're eligible for. Uh, so again, apply every year. They both become available on October 1st. That's a great time to do it or over the winter holidays if you're home for the holidays. Um, always make sure you're checking those due dates. You'll know it once you get to your school, you'll know it. Emmanuel knows it's, I think he got a tattoo actually on his left forearm that says March 1st every year or something like that, he told me. Um, so need versus merit aid. Um, most schools um, will provide some mix of both. Most private colleges, most state schools, it's going to be um, uh, mostly, it's gonna be less of, of both. Um, not all state schools meet, promise to meet uh, all of your financial need. Um, UVA is one of those schools, along with uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, that meets 100% of demonstrated need um, for, for students. And, um, but, some schools, as, as we'll see on one example, they kind of play a little bit fast and loose with what, what so-called merit scholarships. Um, they really go towards filling financial need as, as based upon the FAFSA and the profile and any other documents they ask for you. Um, but it's in the form of um, what, what appears to be and kind of is a merit scholarship. So if you get like the president's scholarship or something like that, it really sort of functions as a need-based um, uh, uh, grant or scholarship for you, um, but uh, it, it looks like a it looks like a merit one. So just just to bear that in mind when you're looking at at the options in front of you. Um, okay, like I said, I really am going to go through these pretty quickly so that we get along our way. So how does a school calculate the need? Every school has uh, a cost of attendance number. Basically, it's the budget. How much does it cost? for Emmanuel to come to the University of Virginia. <clears throat> it's based upon the fact that he's an out-of-state student. Uh, so there's a different tuition rate. Um, there's an allocation or, or an allowance for the housing and for food and for books and other supplies and travel. Uh, there are required fees, all of those things. That makes up the cost of attendance. And then uh, we subtract from that the expected family contribution. And we calculate that canned contribution based upon the FAFSA and the profile and everything else. And, the, the, what's left over is the financial need. So if a school says that they meet 100% of financial need, um, that means that um, they're, gonna, they're really gonna look at that EFC because that's, that's really what drives things. Um, and bear in mind that every school that says they meet 100% of financial need, they calculate things differently. They, they calculate things differently. So for example, some schools, for example, um, if a family looks like they don't have a lot of cash, um, like they don't make a lot of money uh, on, on their tax returns. It looks like they don't make money. And, um, you know, they say they don't have a lot of cash, they don't have a lot of investments, but they'll ask the family what type of cars they have. And if they come back and say, well, I've got a 2019 BMW M5, you know, which is a $130,000 car, um, that school may say, they might, they might sort of factor that into their overall calculation, right? Because if you have the resources, purchase a, an expensive luxury vehicle, um, you, you can take some of that <laughs> resources and put it towards your student's education. So, um, so even schools that say they meet 100% of need, they may, it may actually look pretty different between the schools. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so just bear that in mind. It doesn't mean that they're cheating you necessarily. It just means that they have a different methodology for determining that financial need. But they have to realize, and they do realize, that comparing two schools, and if one of, has given you, they both meet 100% of need, and they're both kind of equal in your mind, one of them gives you $10,000 a year more in grants um, based upon need, you know, that, that might be a pretty easy decision to make between those two schools at least. So, um, okay. So how do we calculate the EFC? As I mentioned, um, there is a calculation that the FAFSA makes, and it's a government calculation. Uh, the profile has its own calculation that is the sort of the baseline for what's called the institutional method. The FAFSA is what's called the federal methodology, right? It's the federal government, uh, Department of Education. But the institutional methodology, that's where the differences can come into place. Some schools um, consider um, if your family owns a home 
and they have equity in the home, which means that they owe less than the, the home is, is worth, then um, they might um, have a formula for, for calculating a little bit in based upon that home equity. Um, some do it based upon, uh, you know, did your parents contribute a lot of money in the previous year to a retirement account or even to a college savings plan? They might say, hmm, well, if, if they had the, kind of like the car, if they had the resources to do that, then maybe, you know, they can afford to stop for a couple of years while the students in school putting the money into that retirement account and instead put it towards the student's education. And so they kind of increase the expected family contribution at that in, in, in that way way. So just bear that in mind. That stuff is going on. Um, <clears throat> and it's nothing sinister about it. It's just their, it's just their methodology. Um, okay, comparing financial aid offers. And this is where we're going to start to get into the meat of things a little bit. Um, so depending upon a school's financial aid policies, um, you, you might find that attending an out-of-state school or a private school um, has a lower net cost than staying at an in-state school. And we'll talk about that net cost. Um, there's the net direct price uh, or net direct costs, and then there's the, the net overall cost. Um, and net just means take the costs that are gonna be billed or that you're going to likely incur, subtract the aid that's available to you, and then, um, and that's sort of what remains is the net cost. And one way to do it, and it's the way that I'm doing it with my daughter right now and with her mom, is I'm saying, okay, let's take the, the, the direct costs that we're gonna be billed, the tuition and the fees. We know we're gonna get billed that. We know we're gonna get billed housing and dining. And let's subtract just the grant funding, just the free money, right, up front. And let's see what that looks like. Before we say to my, my daughter, okay, if you wanna attend this school, you know, this is how much we can pay. And this is kind of the cutoff line of the schools you've been admitted to and that you're interested in still. And this is the cutoff line of schools where you won't have to take out loans. Your mom and I can contribute to this um, to the point where you don't have to take out loans. But if you want to attend these schools, because their aid wasn't as high, their grant funding wasn't as high, you would need to take out your loans and you need to do work study in order to make it happen. Um, and that's not because we don't love our daughter. It's just because, you know, we, we, we don't have endless supply of money um, for that. And we've saved pretty aggressively, we think, over the years. So um, they're just choices, right? And uh, uh, you'll need to sort of factor that in as well. Um, what's the net cost? after grants, what's the net cost after all financial aid? Um, and that may be a significant factor for you and your family as well. Um, okay, uh, so direct costs, like I said, are those things that the school directly bills you for. You will pay the school. So for first year students, that's usually, uh, well, always tuition and usually required fees. Um, some schools lump everything like housing, dining, required fees, everything into the one their sort of tuition costs or what they call a comprehensive fee. Um, and it might be all broken because different schools will list things in different ways. Indirect costs though, those things that the school doesn't directly bill you for up front, things like your books, because they don't know what your books are going to be because of your classes, um, your travel, they're not going to bill you for that, but it's a cost that you're, you and your family are going to have to cover to get you to and from school. Um, and it might be significant, right? The difference between going to Columbia, for example, or going to UCLA from um, you know, the New York metro area, that's a significant difference in the cost of, for travel for one year, let alone for four years. Um, so there are other indirect costs that you'll wanna keep in mind. Uh, and, and every school on their cost of attendance page, should, and frankly, every school will see on some of these letters, some of these um, offer letters, they should be including those, direct, those indirect costs. Um, but there, there's a bit of a sleight of hand, a little bit of hocus pocus magic that they're pulling here it makes it look like you might not actually be paying as much as you, you, you may end up having to pay. Um, again, so what is my offer gonna look like? Grants and scholarships, that's the free money, right? Work study, that's your money. And then loans, that's the borrowed money. Um, work study is money that you earn during the school year. You have to hunt for a work study eligible job and then you'll get paid, usually through the university's payroll system, um, probably every two weeks during the time that you're working during the semesters. Um, all right, uh, grants, start talking, um, start talking with the people at, at, in the financial aid office at your school to make sure that all the grants that you're seeing are renewable and that you understand what the renewal um, requirements are, whether it's GPA based, whether it is something that has like a service uh, a component with it. Um, is it one that decreases over time? Cause that's not good. 
um, you're going to want to be looking not just at the first year, but what it, it means for all four years. And I would ask, that's one of those, going back to the thing to remember here is that you've got to be your own advocate and talk with those schools and have your list of questions, get them all in order, um, have a parent with you, or maybe have your parent make the call and lead it. And you're, you're there to listen in and, um, and then you can you know, handle it from the, from, from there on in the in future years. Um, again, make sure you meet all deadlines to be eligible for, um, and that you apply on time every, every year. So student loans, I'm going to blow through these. It's not really super important right now. The limits do understand this though, is that your annual limits for borrowing go up, um, from your first year to your second year and your second year to your third year. And then it stays the same from your third year to your fourth year. So what that means is that if you're going to a school where you know you're going to be required to take out your loans in order to make it work, um, your, your uh, maximum amount of loan that you're going to be borrowing you know, for your second and third year is going to increase. So you're going to be inc increasing your debt, um, not just in terms of taking out another loan, but it's going to be a larger loan. Because schools, um, as part of meeting that 100% of needs, schools use the subsidized loan to, to, um, to fill need. We do at UVA. Um, I don't know a school that doesn't use that, except for schools maybe who have all grants packages, which in those schools are very few and far between. Um, so if you have loans, just know that the um, maximum amount is going to increase um, to, for, for two more years, and then it'll stay steady for your last year. Um, I'm going to blow through those things. We'll hold off on the Q&A for now. I'm going to quit sharing this and, um, and go on to... Um, uh, the, the next slide, but before we do, are there any questions? Yep, I see one from, from Jose. Um, the question is about uh, undocumented students who can't apply for, for FAFSA. Um, there uh, are, are I, I, I'm not expert in this. Uh, I'm not expert in this, you know, and we have some information actually at the UVA. I'm going to type in here, Jose, um, uh, just so you see it. Um, if you go to um, this website and then just do a search for um, for DACA, D-A-C-A, which is the um, Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals um, program that started in the Obama administration, um, and I know you're talking not talking about DAC about DACA necessarily, um, but on some pages that we have for, um, for for DACA students, we also have some resources for undocumented students, um, and I don't know them chapter and verse. But we've got a great group here at UVA called Undock UVA, and uh, they're really active in that regard. And, and um, University of Virginia has, has just recently, in the last couple of years, made uh, university funds available for um, DACA students. Um, and starting in fall of 22, I think it is, maybe 22, might be 20, I think it's 22, in Virginia at least, there's new state law that allows um, uh, for schools to use state funding as well for undocumented students. Um, so there's, there's progress being made, um, but it really varies from state to state and definitely from school to school. I've, I've seen some of the schools that my daughter applied to um, who say they have a commitment to undocumented students to help uh, provide funding and they know that they can't complete the FAFSA. And so typically what those schools will do is they'll have some form of their own um, to get information that, to, that uh, allows them to essentially manually calculate what their FAFSA um, EFC might be. Um, but I'm not expert in that, Jose, but that's a good place to start is, is on our site and then do a search for DACA. And, uh, and then you'll see some links, I think, for undocumented students. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, any other questions before we jump in and take a look at some fun letters, try to make sense of them? I had a hard time doing it sometimes. And uh, I'm in the business, so you can only imagine what it's like for y'all. Um, um, yes, I have a right. question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so how does submitting documents in the IDOC um, late or past the deadline, how does that affect one's financial aid like offer? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what I would suggest you do is if you think that something has, has gotten in late, is I would follow up a couple days after you submitted it through IDOCs. Um, I would follow up with a contact to the school. Uh, either by phone or by email. Um, if you're going to call on the phone, call as soon as they open in the morning, if you possibly can. If you're still like virtual at home doing school, then, then maybe that's easier than if you're um, in person. Um, I would call and just explain your situation, explain that you just loaded documents and ask them if they have received those documents and um, ask them what their policy is 
Uh, it varies from school to school. So for example, at UVA, um, our March 1 deadline really only applies to the FAFSA and to the CSS profile. Everything else has sort of due dates that are built into the system. Um, but really our perspective on that is as soon as you can get them in, we want them. Um, because otherwise we're kind of in a rush at the end. And if somebody gets us documents on, you know, April the 28th and wants to turn it around, you know, in order for, in two days for them to have it to make a decision, that's going to be really tough for us to do. So um, sooner is better. Talk to the schools. Um, uh, you seem like a very calm and uh, and polite young man, young man, and I, I think that you know that that'll come through in your in your calls to them. And um, like I said, I go back to the they they do want to help and and make sure that um, they just want to finish. They want to be able to finish and do it accurately. So um, I would follow up. I would follow up directly. Yeah. All right, should we take a look at some letters then? Um, I'm gonna go back and share the screen again, <coughs> I hope. Um, we're gonna take a look at, I, I had the, the UVA one, but it's really complicated and I'll tell you why um, when we get to it. I don't wanna lead with that. Um, so let's see, how are we doing? Can you see this colorful screen in front of you? Thank you, Emmanuel, I appreciate that. Um, so this is um, a letter from a Western private school. And uh, um, it lists, as you can see here, the colors are kind of nice, right? They kind of help draw your eye to different sections. And you know where one section ends and the other begins. Um, and what they've done is they've listed very, very nicely and helpfully for us the direct costs, right? Right up here, direct costs for 21, 22 academic year. And that's tuition and fees and uh, the housing and meals. Um, and that's the total, only it's not the total, right? Because there's indirect costs, as we know, because you're smart and you know these things. Um, <clears throat> but they give that total there and then they list the grant money and that's uh, the total of the grant money. And then the net cost, then um, this isn't, I don't know if this is the net direct cost. Can anybody do the math quickly enough? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. So that's the net direct cost. It really probably should say net direct cost. Um, and then they offer up the federal subsidized loan, the unsubsidized loan, and that's $5,500 for the first year. And so the direct, the so-called direct out-of-pocket costs, I wouldn't use that terminology. Um, but this is what they're saying after, basically this is what the um, financial aid, um, I'm sorry, this is what the, the cost to the family would be after uh, all of financial aid has been accounted for, except work study. Um, work study, I, I like what they do here is they break out work study um, as a separate item and they don't include it as um, a, a guaranteed amount towards, the, um, towards reducing the direct out-of-pocket costs. And again, the reason for that is because it's not guaranteed money. Students may decide that they don't want a work study job, but maybe they do get a, a job um, somewhere on campus or somewhere in the town uh, or the city if they're in a large, a large city. And uh, they use money from that job to help you know, cover some of the costs of school as well. So um, this one's, I think from my, per from my um, perspective, a little bit all over the place, um, but uh, you can see here that um, you know, they do call things out pretty clearly. Here's the tuition and fees, it's bolded. Here's the housing and meals, it's bolded. They're gonna start with that stuff. Um, what's not here though, and it's on the second page, which I didn't reproduce here, is it says see back for indirect costs not included here. So this direct out-of-pocket costs, it's the, um, even though they didn't use you know, net direct cost up here, it kind of carries through direct cost to direct out-of-pocket costs. Um, is $31,465. But you have to factor in that there's going to be probably another three to $4,000 in indirect costs that are part of the student's budget. So really, you know, if, if, you're, if you were a student and you're, or a parent and you're thinking, okay, $31,500, um, that's, that's what, what's going to be our responsibility. And, um, but then you realize by looking at the next page, no, it's actually about $4,000, maybe more than that. So there's a bit of a surprise there. Um, and uh, I don't know really how you get around that um, consistently, but you're gonna find that some schools hide those indirect costs. Some of them don't even put them on their financial aid uh, offer letter. So bear that in mind. Um, yeah, just bear that in mind that it might not all look 
um, they might, might not have, might, sorry, all offer letters may not have um, those indirect costs and that may be a little bit confusing, and potentially a little bit misleading. Um, all right, so I think I can go back to the next school. So <laughs> this is a school, um, a state school, and uh, they, there's a lot of white space on here um, because they're displaying this in their student system. Um, and that they don't really have a whole lot of control apparently over the formatting, but it's kind of a mess um, as well, I would, I would say. Um, they uh, talk about um, here up in the, uh, let's see if I can get, I gotta get my special effects, my pointer. Uh, where's my pointer? I think I can spotlight, is that it? No, that's not it. I'm gonna I get my eraser now. That says more. It, where you were earlier? Yeah. Try that maybe, because right now- Oh, I'm sorry. More. Oh, over here. Okay, sorry. Does that work? Um, I'm also not technically inclined once- No, that's okay. I know that there is a pointer, um, but uh, that's okay. Um, we could follow your cursor. Yeah, I guess, I guess oh, my cursor is visible. Okay, that's great. Yeah. I didn't know if it really was. Um, all right. So the cost of attendance for the state school, just over $40,000. Um, this is a school that doesn't use the profile. So they used the family's expected, uh, uh, sorry, estimated, it says estimated family contribution. It's the expected family contribution. Don't let a school mislead you into thinking that it's, it's an estimation of things. It's really what they say, their formula says you can pay, even if it's not true, they, they'll say that. And so um, it's nice here, right? Cause they list the cost of attendance, the family contribution and the need. Um, and uh, they break out the cost of attendance over here pretty clearly, I think. It's just kind of far away, right, from everything else. So there's the tuition and fees, um, uh, the board and the room. Board, if you don't know, is meal. Um, I understood, stand from someone, that it comes from an old, uh, old usage that when you, like, were traveling between villages and you stopped at a, an inn or a pub, you would get a board, basically. <laughs> You'd sit down and there would be a board and your food would come to you on your board. Um, so that's where it comes from, supposedly. Somebody else can look that up and, and correct me if that's if I have an incomplete understanding of that. So, and then there's um, student transition or family programming fees. That's just the orientation fee. There's miscellaneous um, and books and supplies and transportation, right? So that's nice. They break down the cost of attendance, um, but it's just kind of all over the place in terms of how it's how it's organized. Okay, so what do I know? If my eye is drawn, right, we, we start to typically read from the upper left to lower right. So um, I'm drawn here and I say, okay, this is my need, 27,876. Now I can, oops, go down and look, sorry, at um, what my financial aid um, offer is for this upcoming year. I see I've been offered work study, right? So this is a school that actually lumps work study in with the total financial aid, as opposed to the last example where they kept it separate, right? Um, but it, it's still there. It's still an expected part of your um, of your financial aid and something that you can you can uh, potentially max out that award. Um, there's the institutional need based grants, and then there's that federal uh, subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan. That's going to be consistent, right? Because um, this is a student who has demonstrated need, um, and so the maximum subsidized loan in a first year is thirty five hundred dollars, and then it goes up to forty five hundred dollars and then $5,500 for the third and fourth years. That's the maximum for an, a dependent undergraduate student. And when I say dependent, I mean dependent for financial aid purposes. And that's a very spe specific thing. It's not to say that your parents have to claim you on their taxes. Um, that's, that's not what they mean. Dependent for financial aid, it's really hard to be independent for financial aid purposes. It's un not hard, but it's unusual um, for most students to be independent for, for financial aid purposes. And then these two, um, uh, sort of tables down here break out for fall and for spring, okay? But you'll see that the financial aid that's offered is 23,507, but my need, they told me, was 27,876. So that's what um, schools, um, what we call in the business, gapping a student, basically. There is a gap between their need and the amount of aid that they're receiving to, to cover that need. Um, but, and nowhere here does it show, um, you know, what the direct costs are and then what the, um, you know, the, the net direct cost after the grants and then the net direct cost after all forms of aid. Nothing like um, 
you know, our example from uh, over here, which showed um, essentially that, that net cost after grants um, and then um, the net cost, the net direct uh, pocket, out of pocket costs after the loans. Uh, and then again, I think it rightly ignores the, the work study in terms of its presentation. So in some ways you can see this one's a little bit easier. It kind of takes you through the progression. Um, and this one over here, you kind of got to understand some of the inside baseball, right? Some of the talk, um, some of the lingo about, uh, about financial aid in order to figure out um, uh, really what, what it's going to look like out of pocket. There's nothing here that, that says cost to you or anything like that, or here's what your family should expect um, other, than, other than this estimated family contribution at the top, okay? Um, any questions about the first two that we've looked at so far? Or anything else that's occurred to you, even maybe even related to examples that you might have from your schools that are in front of you right now? Okay, if you do come up with a question, feel free to throw it in the chat or um, uh, tell me to take a breath and, and you can ask your question. Um, this next school, again, fairly similar, different format, right? It's a little more pleasing to the eye um, in that it's, it's organized, this, you know, these lines, it, it's sort of what we're used to seeing in terms of uh, display of numbers. Um, they have their tuition, their room and board, their base fees, and so this is the build costs so or, you know, so they use build costs as opposed to direct costs, but they're essentially the same thing. They use direct costs here, but it's the build costs. I don't know why they kind of switch between the two, but they do. Um, and so you might get thrown, but maybe, maybe you might not too. And then they right up above, right at the top, they show the indirect costs too, the estimated indirect costs. And I think that that's really helpful because it gives you more of this full picture of is this 66, 680, uh, of the, the overall cost of attendance. And again, these costs, because they're not directly billed, they might be less or more depending upon the types of courses you take. Um, if your travel, you know, if you live in the town where you're going to school, your travel uh, is not gonna be much. Um, but if you're traveling from a far distance, it might, you might blow this through the $600 on your first ticket, your first plane ticket um, uh, to school. Uh, down below is the breakout, the scholarships and grants. That's nice. They, they, they have a section just for the scholarships and grants. Uh, they break it out by semester and then by total over here. Uh, the subsidized loan, again, they break it out by semester and by um, and the total amount over here. And the unsubsidized loan and work study. So they, like the, the, the second school I showed you, they count the work study as, as um, in when calculating your sort of, um, uh, your, your, their total, well, of course, the total aid. Um, but they don't sort of net it out, right? They don't sort of say, okay, well, so take this amount here, this total cost of attendance, or even just the direct cost, and then subtract this, and then tell me what my direct out-of-pocket costs are. They do it. They do it indirectly by putting at the bottom what they expect your out-of-pocket costs would be, um, based on your direct costs, what you're being billed by the school minus your your aid. Again, they're including that work study, which isn't real money. Um, it's uh, this, thing, this is what's going to be expected for each of the two firms. So this is um, really um, essentially the difference between the build costs and the uh, and the federal and, and the financial aid. So again, it's kind of it's kind of confusing. It's a little bit different still from the previous ones, and every school has their reason for it. Some schools they just have limitations with their technology. And they don't have the funding to make a change to um, display it in a different way. Um, some schools struggle with that. And some schools just haven't prioritized that. They, they take a different approach, which is to say, no, people have to learn the language, they have to learn the, the lingo, um, and they have to ask questions. Um, I think that's pretty rare. Um, but I think that the technology problems are not rare, um, actually. Uh, there are real challenges and real limitations in terms of what schools uh, are able to do. So that's a third example. Um, and let's see, this is from Smith College. Some of you may have heard about um, up in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, about two or three hours away from, from New York. Um, this is, uh, again, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, looks like it might be based upon that sort of, um, they break it down by terms. So here's the total financial aid. They just get right, cut right to the chase. Total financial aid um, and then the total cost of attendance 
and then they break it down by term. Now, this is really interesting. What this school does, each of these loans has um, a fee associated with it. So that $3,500 loan is actually going to be less what you're going to get from that. You're going to borrow $3,500, but you're only going to get $3,462 um, credited to your account. And that's because <clears throat> that's because of these loan fees. You never, ever see that money, but you will have to pay it back one day. Um, so it's helpful, I think, to call out the loan fees. Um, other schools um, do that as well. Um, so this is, this is, I think, pretty useful. So this is the total financial aid paid to student account. So that's the grants, and they assume you're going to take out your loan. Um, and when, it, when you do, those funds go straight towards paying off your, um, your bill. Now, then there are other bills, uh, other items to be billed to the student. They've got um, room and board. They've got an activity fee. Uh, I'm sorry. These are the things to be billed to the student. Um, and, and the total here, if it's greater than this, there's going to be a, an amount owed. And if it's less than this number up here, um, this total financial aid to pay to the account, then it's going to be, uh, this can be a refund to the student. Um, again, to help pay for things that are not directly billed, like books and supplies. Um, notice as well, this school, Smith, also lists the health insurance. And this isn't, uh, a, every school um, to some degree requires students to have a, a, a health insurance coverage that is at least as good as a policy that the school requires, right? It's, it's sort of baseline level of coverage. Um, it's interesting to me that they put it inside the cost of attendance because uh, in many cases, students are able to waive it. What this tells me is that this school basically charges that to everybody up front, and then if you can effectively, if you can, uh, uh, if you can successfully waive the requirement by showing that you have proof of your insurance, then they take that charge off. Um, some schools go that route. UVA, for example, goes the opposite route. Um, we allow students to waive first. Uh, there's a deadline for waiving after that time. Then it'll be placed on the student's account, typically in like in late September of the of the first semester, um, or in late January or early February if they if they come in in the, in the spring term. So uh, different schools do it different ways. Um, but if you see this on your school's uh, financial aid offer, you might inquire about that and say, is this something that you do you do, do you allow for what's called a hard waiver? Um, and uh, what's the process for that? And um, you know, is this charge going to appear on my account automatically and then I have to waive it? Or is it something that gets billed later? Again, this is part of the self-advocacy here. Um, so this is kind of nice, right? They've got the amount that's going to be billed to the student. So they're clearly going to build the health insurance. Um, they assume I'm going to take the loan, I'm the student, and I'm going to take the loan. And so they subtract the aid from the cost, and that's the amount that's going to be due each semester. Um, and then this is kind of helpful. I like the way they've done this. Um, they list other things that um, might help to either increase that cost or to um, reduce that cost. So they say additional financial aid and other costs. So this is the work study. Again, this is a hypothetical job that I could get uh, on campus to help defray my costs. Um, but then there are these other, these other costs that are not billed, but that um, uh, I might incur. Again, the personal supplies, books, travel, things like that. <clears throat> so this is actually, I think, pretty, pretty helpful. Um, and the, the use of blue space, uh, blues on the, uh, blue on the bars here is helpful. My eyes drawn to it. I can kind of sort of see what's going on. Um, I still have to kind of piece it out, but um, anyway, so I'm going to take a breath here and see, are there any questions that people have as we're sort of getting more examples, seeing some of the differences? All right. I think I have one more. Yeah, this is Kenyon College. Does anybody know where Kenyon College is? Bonus points. I'll take the state, but if you can tell me the town it's in, that's even better. So, nope, no takers. Nobody, nobody applied to Kenyon. So Kenyon is in a town called Gambier, Ohio, and it it pretty much is the town. It's a it's a small school, and um, they're about sixteen hundred students. And uh, it's, a, it's really a village. It's really a village um, in uh, sort of North Central Ohio. It's a great school, uh, liberal arts college. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of text on this page, right? There's a lot. 
Um, they're using a gray box here to try to um, organize some things. Um, that's helpful. And this is an example. You can see this, this uh, applicant was offered this president's, president's scholarship, right? $10,000 in the fall, $10,000 in the spring. This is really essentially though, it's a need-based need uh, award. It's a need-based award, even though it's on a separate line item from this Kenyan need-based grant. Um, it may be because the student has shown um, meritorious um, work um, in, in preparing for college, but it functions as uh, a way for them to meet um, that the, the student's financial need. That makes sense. Um, there's the federal direct lo subsidized loan again, the unsubsidized loan, there's the work, work study. And there's this interesting thing, which um, I had not seen before, which is why I chose this one to include, is this book allowance, um, which is essentially a free credit um, that a student can use at the Kenyan College Bookstore. So it's not directly applied to charges, but it is sort of a form of aid, if you will. Um, it helps to reduce the indirect costs, right? Um, that a student is going, to, is going to incur for the books and, and other supplies. Um, okay, so the total aid uh, here is $55,658. They list down here the billable costs, right? Again, it's just the billable costs. And those are 76,620. And so the estimated balance after financial aid, and of course they exclude work study, which I think they should, is this amount here, this 22,462. Again, that doesn't include the indirect costs, right? Doesn't include those indirect costs, which I think are on the second page. I just took the first page here. Um, so that's, you know, that's, a, a, that's kind of helpful. I, I kind of see it's, it's, in, it's in bold. Um, there are some links here if I want to find out about origination fees. Uh, it's nice that they, they call those out. Um, and then there's a link here to the Office of Student Accounts, which is helpful if I have questions and, and need it. And they tell me that it's an official offer, they tell me the aid year, um, you know, this is, this is pretty good as well, just kind of, just kind of text heavy. Um, I'm going to quit sharing and I'm going to bring up the UVA example because there's a lot of text on this. There's a lot of text and I'll explain why there's a lot of text on this. Um, actually, we're nearly running out of, we're running out of time. Do we have time to do this or do people have questions that we need to get to? I'd rather get, I'd rather get to your questions before I, I, I show you one more, just one more example. Um, so what are the things that, that, that you, you know, don't get um, yet from looking at your uh, financial aid offers or that you feel like you still need to know before you can make a decision between schools A, B, and C? Wait, just to clarify, are we going to not talk about, so we're not talking about the UVA letter instead of we're doing a Q&A? I, I just wanted to make sure that we had time for that, but I can show the UVA letter. Yeah, because there are a couple people here. Yeah, great question about matching. Um, the answer is generally no. If a school meets, uh, purports to meet 100% of need, um, provided they haven't made a mistake um, in their calculations, which happens, um, but you would probably have a sense for that because you might see one where you know you've gotten three offers and these are from schools that meet 100% of need and they all are pretty much within a range there might be you know a couple of outliers um, or or it might be like a difference of a couple thousand dollars between them and then you get one that looks like it's like a difference of like $20,000 um, not in your favor and you might you know wonder well if they say they also meet 100% of need i wonder if it might be a boo boo and there are you know more respectful ways than others to to bring that up to bring it to their attention and say, hey, I've got some other offers from schools that meet full need. Um, yours is a little bit different. Um, you know, can I ask, can I ask, is it possible that there might have been a mistake made in the calculation? Um, would somebody be willing to sort of run the numbers again, something like that? But generally speaking, schools that meet 100% of need, they will not negotiate um, the financial aid because their methodology is their methodology. Um, so I had, for example, a, a conversation with a financial aid um, officer from one of the schools that my daughter had applied to, and they won't also they also won't disclose information too much information about their methodology. It's proprietary, um, and so I know that. And I told them up front. I work for a school that does institutional methodology calculations. I kind of know what I'm talking about on this, and I'm not trying to argue the 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 offer. 
I just want to make sure I understand. Um, and I was able to kind of figure out by the end of the conversation how they were calculating certain elements of, um, you know, my financials and, and my, um, uh, my daughter's mother's financials. Um, and it was different. It was different from, from other schools. And so I, I had my answer. Um, but sometimes schools will make a mistake. Um, so always, if something looks odd, feel free to reach out and just very politely ask them if it's possible to do a review to make sure that, that there weren't any, perhaps any errors in the calculations. Um, but they will generally not negotiate um, or go back for more. They, if, they, um, if they have, they, they, typically, what they're, they're going to come out of the gate because every other school does this. They're going to come out of the gate with their best offer, is what it comes down to. Um, let's see if there's anything else I suggest. Um, also at the UVA, uh, you're welcome, Adrian. Yeah, on the UVA website, if you do a search, um, sorry, the UVA uh, Student Financial Services website, if you do a search for glossary, um, you should find a link to a glossary of financial aid terms. And that might be useful as well to take a look at. Um, some of them we've, we've talked about here tonight, but others um, are, are on there as well. And it's, it's crazy that we have to have a, a separate glossary, right, to talk about this stuff, but there's a lot of jargon in financial aid. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's any other sort of points to consider. Oh, I, I do ask them again um, what their philosophy is, what they tell people about how financial aid offers may change from one year to the next. Um, typically, the big factors that account for that are um, number of students in college, number of siblings in college, um, and uh, the number in the household. Um, so, for example, if you entered school and you, there was already a sibling of yours in college, um, that means that they were taking sort of the family contribution and splitting it roughly equally between the two students. Um, so that when that older sibling um, graduates out, that full amount of, of expected family contribution, assuming that everything's pretty consistent year to year, is gonna to fall to you. And so you might see your financial aid change dramatically. On the other side, if you're the oldest, say, and there's a sibling behind you, it might look high this year, but know that if your sibling goes to school, uh, to college as well the next year, then you're gonna probably see your financial aid increase. But I would, I would ask schools just to make sure um, is this just a first year thing? Um, are you going to, are, is this what I should expect to see generally from year to year? Um, what, what do you tell people in your presentations? Uh, it's always a good question to ask. Um, if you do speak with people, ask for their name um, and then keep notes of who you spoke with at the school, what they said um, and the date that you spoke with them, uh, just so you have it for your record. So you can call back, if you have to call back, you can say, um, hi, this is, this is Michael. Um, I spoke with Emmanuel last week about this and I had a couple follow-up questions. It shows that, you know, you're serious, you're paying attention and you're respectful of, of them and their time as well and, and what they're trying to accomplish. So, um, let's see. Any other, any other questions? I know we're right up against time, but um, I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer questions if you have them. Maybe I can ask a question of Michael and, and, and Liz, put you guys on the spot a little bit. Um, what, what do you feel like was um, something that you didn't know then, but you, you know and understand now, and you're like, you're totally, you know, king and queen, and you, listen and you understand it, and you can, you know, explain it to, to anybody on the street who would be willing to listen, um, but that was, you know, confusing or concerning as you were, you know, maybe comparing offers between schools. Any yeah. um, the first thing is definitely like, don't be scared to talk to your financial aid officer. I know that's something that people like, you know, especially from high school, it's like, it's not a teacher. So of course you don't want to reach out to them, but they're definitely a really great resource and they're more than willing to try their best to accommodate and look over financial aid papers. Even if you have to nudge them a few times, they're definitely still there to help. I know like I got, I spoke to Yale when my dad spoke to Yale and I ended up getting substantially more money from Yale after explaining that what they offered, like the offer that they gave me wasn't like feasible. Oh, okay. So that was what a situation where, so did they ask for more information from your, from your family before doing that? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Essentially, they yeah they asked for more information. We had to like, clear things up in like yeah. a meeting, but it still worked pretty well. And then I also know of students in the past who've gone into multiple Ivy League schools, and then what they do is they actually will like cross the offers against one another, and end up getting even more money. Well, good. That's good. That's so French, yeah, like, That's great to hear. That's counter to my uh, to my um, experience, but that's good to hear. So maybe my last bit of advice about don't expect too much might be not all that accurate, depending upon the schools that if you've got multiple schools kind of competing for you, um, then then you might be able to you might be able to get some leverage on them. So I, I, I'll sort of really qualify what I previously said. Yeah, Those are know, private it's not going to work at UVA. <laughs> so, yeah, it might be more of a private school thing. I know like um, the student was taught choosing between Yale and UPenn and I got more money from Yale, but they told UPenn the offer and then UPenn ma matched and made it a little yeah. bit better. And then they went back to Yale and gave them the offer and then they went to Yale. Yeah, right. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Because for the for, at that point, this for the schools, it's an incremental difference. Um, it's not an absolute difference. And so um, yeah, if they want that student, they might be willing to make a budge. Yeah. I think the presentation, let me go back to it, but I think the presentation has, it doesn't have it, but Max has my email, uh, address and, and of course, Max, you should feel very free to, to share it, um, with the group. So if people do have questions after the fact you want, or you just didn't want to ask it in front of other people. That's completely legit. Um, and I, I wouldn't blame you, but if you do want to, if you do want to reach out, we can maybe set up time for a phone call or um, we, if it's something we can handle by email, we can handle by email. Um, but let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm around and I'd be happy to help with that. Hey, there's Max. Hey, made it a little bit late, but I know for a lot of people, myself included, it takes some time to really yeah. you know, ruminate and uh, digest the information to then come up with questions. So um, definitely feel free to just shoot your questions to one of us and we can get it over to Chris. I know you, you have a lot of decisions to make with your your own family and all, but um, I know you've always been so helpful. So um, can definitely do that if you guys still have questions. Yeah, and if you want to take a screenshot and uh, of anything that you're looking at and you wanna draw my attention to anything that you don't understand, um, a screenshot would be helpful for that. Cause I, I obviously, you know, as you can see, there's a wide variety in formats uh, of these letters. So um, feel free to add that in if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, and I'll be happy to, to do whatever I can to answer your questions. Yeah. And if there are no more questions, and I will just share my screen, have a cute little ending screen over here. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I will be in chat. I will be putting down the um, email list so you guys can kind of, so you guys can join and hear more about whatever calls we're having. I know that they've been immensely helpful for me and I'm in college, so I can't imagine you guys who are applying to college or have applied and are kind of waiting to make a choice. Um, and we will be forwarding you guys an email with the um, with the deck of like all the slides that Chris presented with earlier. And we will also um, have a recording that we will either send to you or you can find on our YouTube page probably a day or two from now, considering how long it may take to edit. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone.